Amen. And y'all remain standing, please. We're so grateful uh, this morning uh, to have Brother Lisa and Brother Jamie uh, back with us, and they brought a new addition, another prophet, Nathaniel James. Amen. Amen. The Simons. Brother Lisa, Brother Jamie, and Sister Lisa uh, Simon, and you know, they uh, uh, may your tribe increase. The, the scripture says, blessed is the man who have a quiver for. And I did a Hebrew study of the word quiver, and I think it's four or five. That's what it said. <laughs> four or five arrows in your quiver. So you got a ways to go yet, but we'll be praying for you, my brother. <laughs> amen, amen. We're also uh, uh, we're so grateful to the Lord this morning to have uh, uh, brother, brother Carl and, and uh, our dear sister with us. Uh, brother Corey Robinson and, and uh, his wife, uh, they're going to have a baby. Amen. So the Brewers, they sitting right over here. Amen. They're going to be grandparents again. Amen. Amen. And Sister Gladine, she's about one of the prayingest folk I know. How many grandsons you got? She's been fasting and praying that God would send her a granddaughter. And I think she's finally shook heaven, I believe. And they're expecting the granddaughter. I believe they're going to have uh, the, the uh, shower this weekend, Sister Gladine. What time? Three o'clock. They're gonna have a shower for uh, for the Robins here at the Grace Bible Church, and so uh, we're so grateful that y'all be praying for them. Y'all know that Brother Corey is one of my favorite people in the whole world, and so we're so grateful to the Lord. Just thankful to the Lord. He's blessed them down there in Atlanta, and uh, now that uh, <laughs> my uh, my brother-in-law down in Virginia, he told his son that he need to get some responsibility. And so he wouldn't bought a car. <laughs> he wouldn't got a car. Dad was saying he didn't take a wife and have some kids. He said, he said I need some responsibility, so I wouldn't got a car. <laughs> and so I, would, I see people getting, having children, they're getting responsibility, amen. Their lives are change forever, but in a good way, in a good way. Let's bow before the Lord and ask the Lord's blessing upon our gifts that we brought this morning to give to him and pray that he would consecrate them uh, to his glory. Amen. Amen. And not, it doesn't matter how small or how great, if it's from your heart, you really desire to worship the Lord. Uh, we, wish, we should worship God in proportion to how he has blessed us. And so the Lord has blessed us with much, we should give much. And if we don't have much to give, we give out of our hearts devotion and commitment and love for the Lord. Amen. 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 Let's bow together. Father, we're so grateful for the privilege of worshiping you in our tithes and with our offerings. And Lord, we could never repay you for all that you have done for us and that which you continue to do for us. But this does symbolize our commitment and our acknowledgement of the fact that all that we have and all that we are is because of you, Lord. As our dear sister in choir has already ministered so beautifully in song, because of who you are, we give you glory. We give back to you that which you've entrusted us. Now bless these worshipers as they come. And give them great joy and continue to strengthen them with health and strength and with opportunity, Lord, to labor out of the marketplace where they can be witnesses for you. And bless the labor of their hand and their mind that their needs might be met, the needs of their family. And they can give to support the work of God. In Jesus' name, amen. With great enthusiasm and great pathos, be led by the ushers, starting from the back to the front, and bring your gifts and present them to the Lord. Blessings and glory, 
and honor. your attention to the 25th chapter of Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 25, amen, Matthew chapter 25, I'm so grateful this morning to see two of my favorite people in all the world, Brother Larry and Sister Belinda Griggs, these are home folk. Y'all raise your hands so they can see y'all. These are my home folk. Belinda's my cousin. We grew up like brothers and sisters back in Mount Hope. And uh, she's one of the most courageous people I know. Matthew chapter 25, and I want to begin reading with verse 31, and I'll read several verses, and we're going to try to uh, look at the uh, 35 through the end of the chapter. Where's brother, uh, brother Jordan, Melissa's grandson? I want to make sure he's not in here because he got a watch. <laughs> and every minute he telling me what time it is. <laughs> That's the watch. It's 9.31. It's 9.32. So I got to make sure I keep him out of here. <laughs> Matthew chapter 25. Look at verse 31. I'm reading from the King James translation of the Holy Scripture this morning. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory... And all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungred and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, you've done it unto me. 
Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they say also, also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungry, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. May God put his blessing be to his word, and may it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for its entrance gives light, and to speak to us, that we might see Jesus in all of his majesty, splendor, and glory. And we might heed what he has to say to us. Open the heart, the mind, the ear, that person has never come to faith in Christ. Maybe today they will say, yes, Lord Jesus, come into my life and save me. Glorify your own self, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject of the great separation. The great separation. My college roommate, longtime friend, Pastor Ron Sherrod from the coal fields of Greenbrier County, used to sing a song, God is going to separate the right from the wrong one day. God is going to separate the right from the wrong one day. He said, you throw a rock and try to hide your hand. And then you pretend you've been born again. God going to separate the right from the wrong one day. <laughs> There's a great separation that's coming. God is going to separate the right from the wrong, the just from the unjust, the righteous from the wicked. I've been trying to complete a little assignment. Seldom in your life do you get the opportunity to do something to help your hero, or one of your heroes. And one of my heroes in my life of all time is Dr. John Perkins in Mississippi. And those of you who know me over the last 25 years, you know how much influence that Dr. Perkins has had on my life. I read his books that I got back in 1980, and get his tapes when I could get them. And last year he came here and spoke uh, to us here at the Grace Bible Church. And he found out something about our work, and he said, will you come down and help my daughter? He's turning over his ministry to his baby daughter, Elizabeth. And will you help her start some of the things like you guys are trying to do there in Charleston? It's, in his latter years, he's developed a tremendous affection and endearment for youth that are incarcerated. And a couple of times a month, he goes uh, in the state of Mississippi to the juvenile correctional facility. And so we were down there with him a couple of days this week, and we went to one of these juvenile detention facilities, and I tell you what, it just ripped you up. In Jackson, Mississippi, 94% of all the juveniles that appear before the juvenile court are African-American males. And they opened up this room where all these young boys, well, they looked like little boys, ages about 13 to probably about 17. And it just, something just, just totally just ripped you up and you would see them there in this facility. And they're trying to help these kids, but I mean, the community, I thought Charleston was bad. But Jackson, is, it's, it's just unbelievable what has taken place in this little small southern city. And then we went down to a place called Mendenhall, and that's where Dr. Perkins started his ministry about 40 miles south of Jackson over 40 years ago. They have a 120-acre farm there. And a fellow that I met by the name of Elder Thigpen has got this vision to help these young men. And what I saw there was nothing short of amazing, Sister Levetta. Nothing short of amazing. Brother Thigpen likes sports. And he's coached and he has helped kids along the way and so forth. And so he just had an old raggedy AAU team. And a kid from Jacksonville, Florida had gotten in trouble and Someone knew him, so they sent the kid from Jacksonville to Jackson, Mississippi to live with him, and the kid becomes an all-state player at Jackson and goes on to college and so forth, and somebody else heard it. So they're all over the country. People found out about this minister down in Mendenhall, Mississippi. I mean, it, I didn't even see a stoplight in Mendenhall. Mendenhall, I'm talking about the rural south. 
And what Thigpen has done, he's turned this big farm into this place. And he got these giants down there. Young men, 6'8", six, 6'10", six, seven feet tall, from New York, from New Jersey, from Philadelphia, from around the country. And they've come there so their lives can be saved. And I was talking to some of those young men, and he says, look, I would have been dead or I would have killed somebody on the street of Brooklyn, New York, had I not gotten out of the city. And I got down, I hate it when I got down here, but being down here in the middle of nowhere, and they got to get up, and they got to slop hogs, and they got to take her to guard, and they got to do all this stuff that you have to do on a farm. And these giant young men are like little boys again. They're discovering things they've never seen before, like a tree, and like a leaf, and like a four-leaf clover. Your children, they don't see things like that. Oh, they're there, but they don't see them. Their world is not focused on God's creation. Therefore, they go through the world without seeing the beauty of God's creation. See how much God really cares and the concern he has for us that he would stitch together this marvelous, grand, majestic earth and all of its majesty, splendor, and beauty so that we would have a place to live and not be bored. And as I was flying back in over those mountains, I tell you what, nothing is more majestic than the mountains of West Virginia when you've been away from home. And to see the beautiful kaleidoscope of colors and the fall in the trees being in the fall finale of the glory of this particular season. And I said, oh, wow, what a God. Who would want to serve him? Who would want to come to know him? But even though all the beauty of creation, all that God has done, there's still people who don't have an ear to hear what thus saith the Lord. And so we tried to minister to those young men, my brother-in-law and I, to tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ, the lover of their soul that can turn their situation around. And right there with two snapshots, I saw these young men locked up. I saw these older young men on a farm learning how to be men. And in that, there was hope. Maybe the generation of some of these young people can be saved and come and know the Lord before the great separation day. In these days, for some reason, God had just been impressing upon me, impressing upon me with great heaviness, this idea that we're moving toward this cataclysmic ending. We're moving toward the end. And all the signs in our society and our world today suggest that something is getting ready to happen. We can't go on like this forever. Things seem to be almost spiraling, almost out of control from the human eye. When you look at someone like that fellow over in North Korea, the thought of him having a nuclear or an atomic bomb. Look at the gentleman over in Iran, the thought of him having a nuclear and an atomic bomb. And we don't even talk about Gaddafi anymore. It's not like he's got any more sense than what he ever had. And here Fidel Castro is on his last leg, and who knows what's going to happen in Cuba. When he dies, he has been a stabilized influence as he's ruled that nation with an iron fist. And we move from one thing to the next. That situation still isn't resolved over there with Syria and Lebanon and Israel. Everything just seems to be coming up at the seams all at the same time. As my brother-in-law said, man, the church ought to be as busy as a one-legged man in the behind kicking contest. <laughs> With all this going on, we ought to be busy about doing God's work. I trust that maybe God will use these humble words today to give you a glimpse of what's coming. So we should move with the greatest sense of urgency to tell friends and family members and neighbors and acquaintances and co-workers about this Jesus Christ that we know, love, and that we serve. This is a part of the Olivet Discourse. This is a part of the last words of Jesus that he shared with his disciples before his betrayal and before his crucifixion. So in Matthew 24, he responds to the question of what should be the sign of these end times? What should be the sign of it all, Lord, before the end comes? And he talks about the wars and the rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence. He talks about disease in, all over the planet. He talks about the, the instability of the world. And he says, all oh, that is just the beginning of sorrows. So Matthew 24, you read that chapter, there is a litany that Jesus lays out of the things that are going to come upon the earth. And we see these things being set in motion before our very eyes. And because it happens slowly, we fail to realize it. 
The third is pestilence. We're talking about the AIDS epidemic that threatens to annihilate entire nations on the continent of Africa. We talk about famine still in sub-Saharan Africa that is unprecedented. People still dying of starvation. We're talking about a potential AIDS epidemic in this country where there are millions that are already HIV positive that may grow into full-blown AIDS, which will be a, take a tremendous toll on the health system of this country. While at the same time we have an aging population that will have all the natural health consequences that AIDS brings, and the toll that will take on the health system in this country. We're headed toward some difficult and some hard and some arduous times. We're looking at the situation in Iraq. There is absolutely no end in sight. And whether you are for it or whether you are against it, it really doesn't matter. We're in it. And it's sort of like opening the cage to a tiger and then grabbing him by his tail. And once you get a hold to his tail, now what you going to do? We got him by the tail. Now what are we going to do that we got him by the tail? And this thing will continue to take the toll on the economy of this nation as billions of dollars will have to be spent to try to bring some sense of stability in that part of the world because you cannot leave a void in Iraq because of Iran. They neutralize each other, but a weakened Iraq basically sets the stage for the Iranians to dominate that part of the world and thus take control of much of the world's oil reserves, and that can't be stood. And we can argue all of this democracy, and we can all this liberating the people, but at the end of the day, what we need is the oil ships liberated to come out of that part of the country and bring it here so we can drive SUVs and gas guzzlers. And turn the thermostat up on 90 in the winter time and down on 60 in the summer so we can consume a disproportionate amount of the world's fuel. We face some difficult days, y'all. We're moving towards something. And Jesus talks about these difficult days in Matthew 24. And then Matthew 25, he talks about what's going to happen just before he comes and when he comes. And so in verses 1 through 13 of Matthew 25, he tells the parable of the ten virgins, five who were wise and five who were foolish, five who had enough oil, five who were prepared, and five who were not. So the moral to that parable is be already ready. Well, you know not what day, what hour, what time when your Lord comes. Be ready. The second parable of Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30, tells the parable of the master, the wealthy landowner, who divided to his servants his resources. He gave one five, and he gave one two, and he gave one one. And he gave them resources based on their ability. God gives us opportunity based on our ability. God knows what our abilities are. So sometimes we get frustrated because God don't allow us to do something that he allows someone else to do. It's because he's not given us that ability. And if we can be satisfied with what God has called us to do and find fulfillment with what God has called us to do, God customizes the gift that he gives to us. He also customizes the opportunity that he gives us to discharge those gifts. And so if we just be faithful, we can have an impact and a life of relevance. So he gave one five because he had the ability to manage five. He gave one two because he had the ability to manage two. And he gave one one because he knew he wasn't going to do nothing anyhow. And then he comes back and he reckons with him. One with five, he multiplied it five more. Behold, Lord, you gave me five. I've multiplied them. Now you got ten. One with two. Behold, Lord, you gave me two. Now there's four. The one with one. Lord, well, I, I knew that you was a hard man and you sold where you didn't reap and you were just difficult to deal with, so I didn't do nothing. The Lord says, you wicked and slothful servants, you really wasn't my servant at all. And your actions, your actions, not your words, your actions demonstrated and proved that you really didn't love me, you really were not committed to me, and you really didn't work for me because when I wasn't there to watch you, you did nothing. So he's casting out of darkness. The theme to the second parable is diligence. If we really know God, if we've really been saved, sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit, if we really are the children of God, how diligent are we at the task that God lays before us? How diligent are we? How thrift are we? How enterprising are we? How committed are we to doing what God has called us to do? Be diligent because the master's coming. And you've got to give account to him for your diligence for your service, for your commitment, 
for how you manage what he entrusted to you. So in the third part of Matthew 25, it's not a parable at all. He pulled back the veil of the future. And he allows them to eavesdrop at what would take place when he came back. So in Matthew 25, 31, he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Stop right there. The first thing I see is a great and glorious king's manifestation. See, when he left out of here, he exited as if he was a malefactor, as if he was a thief. He was bruised and battered, manhandled and mauled, condemned to be crucified, crucified between two thieves in humiliation and shame and disgrace. But when he comes back, he's coming back in his royal regalia. He's coming back with pomp and with pageantry and with glory. He says, I see a great and glorious king's manifestation. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and not only that, there's going to be a great white throne that's decorated. And all of the holy angels with him. And, shall, and then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. A glorious king's manifestation. An entourage of the holy angels. Great pageantry and great glory as the king of glory returns. And Matthew, recording Jesus' words, says, and he takes his seat on his throne. His angels flanking him. His throne decorated with glory. Verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations. Stop right there. A great gatherings required presentation. In this text, he's talking about the Gentile nations. All the nations of the world will be gathered around this great throne where the great and glorious king is sitting on his throne. That's going to be a great presentation. Read in the book of Revelation, it says the earth got to give up its dead. The sea got to give up its dead. The dead got to get up from the grave, and they got to appear for this great, grand presentation before the royal, majestic king. Great presentation. So people live and they do what they think they can do and live the way they want to live and they think they do it with impunity and, they, and they're escaping the all-seeing eye of God. No, there is a great required presentation. Because all of the dead must appear at this place. So this great required presentation. And then Matthew goes on to write these words, verse 32, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. I see a great separation. <laughs> I see a great separation. You see, now we don't really know who, who's saved. We think we know. We take people on their profession of faith, and there are people who go to church but have never put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, never trusted him as their personal Savior. And they really aren't saved. And sometimes they convince themselves that they are saved. But on this great day, at this great required presentation, there's going to be a great separation. In the Hebraic culture, the goats and the sheep would often graze together. <laughs> They'd out there be in the fields together, on the hillside, grazing together. But when it was time for them to come into the sheepfold, the shepherd would stand at the gate of his sheep. And the goats, they would come up to the gate of the sheep because they knew that they could tell how sheep looked, they were well cared for. And they would come to the gate of the sheep and the shepherd would stand in front of the gate and say, nope, not you. You can't come in. A great separation. Sometimes you rush into these amusement parks, and they got these uh, gates and corridors for traffic control. So they'll wind you all around the thing like that before you can get to the gate. You know why? Because they want you 3850 before you get in. <laughs> you see? So they make sure you come through the turnstile one at a time. Not no ganging up at the gate. No, you're going to come through one at a time. And they create a single file at this great required presentation. All the nation will be there. And then the shepherd, the royal king, will start to separate the sheep from the goat. Sheep from the goat. And the sheep he will place on his right hand and the goats on his left. Verse 34, then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, 
Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You know, my children sometimes say to me, to flatter me at times, to embarrass me at other times. They said, Dad, you're one of the smartest people we know. And you work harder than anybody we know. But you ain't got much to show for it. <laughs> you ain't got much to show for it. Now, because I'm a man of God, I don't say what I want to say. <laughs> what I want to say is, you're right, except on one point. I want to say, me and your mom, we got a little bit of stuff. You ain't got nothing. <laughs> That's what I want to say. I, I want to say I ain't got much, but I got something. You ain't got nothing. But I don't say that because I'm a man of God. I'm a father who's trying to be a man of God. So I just don't say nothing. But I be thinking it. <laughs> and I'm like the little boy who was in the room and the, Teacher kept on telling him to sit down, to sit down. And finally she came and she put her arms on his shoulder and she pressed him down in the seat. And he looked at her and he said, I'm sitting down on the outside. I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> so I, I, on the inside, I'd be thinking it. And then I have to confess it to the Lord. That wasn't a good thought, Lord. But you know it's the truth anyhow. This required presentation for this great separation. But look what he says. He says to them, come ye. Blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. We're laboring not for that which can be seen, but for that which is invisible. For that which we see is temporal. Those things which are invisible, those are the things that are eternal. And God has reserved from things for those who love him from the foundation of the world. When God spoke the universe into existence, God has a laid web plan up in heaven, and God knew in advance every person that would put their faith in Jesus Christ, so God put something in laid way and put your name on it. He put your name on it. I remember mean, my children were younger, and my wife would start doing Christmas probably in about August or October, and she'd be getting stuff, and she was hiding stuff here and hiding stuff there, and I remember one Christmas, it was like, in June, after Christmas, I was finding stuff that she had hid and forgot where she hid it. And, 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 but she forgot that the name tags had fallen off of it, so I didn't know what it was. Now, I'm going to tell y'all what I did, but y'all don't tell them. I just opened it up to see what it was. And then I just gave it to the next one when they had a birthday or some special event. See? And I assumed that was legitimate because it probably was my money bought anyway, so I could give it to who I wanted to give it to at whatever time I wanted to give it to them. But God has some stuff reserved for you. Lay a way up in heaven for you. First Peter says, you are kept so you can get what God got reserved for you. God has to keep you from falling so he can present you faultless before his glory so he can give you what he has reserved for you. For you. If God allows you to be lost after you were saved, then what he has reserved for you will be laying up in heaven for nobody to claim. But there will be no unclaimed gifts up in heaven. God is going to keep you and then present you there and then give you what he has laid up for you for the foundation of the world. Oh, bless his holy name. And that's what we're laboring for. Not for the stuff down here that gets too small. It's amazing how we sort of uh, amuse ourselves, right? We go to the closet and we pull out a garment and we say, well, oh, that's too small. No, it ain't too small. It's the same size it was when we bought it. <laughs> it's the same size it was when we purchased it. It's not too small. So what does that mean? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> but it won't be too small for us either. Because God knew in advance what we'd be like when we got there. So it'd be just right for us. So he says, come on, come on, you blessed of my Father. Come on in and inherit what the Father has prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then after this great separation, there's a great, great, bold declaration. He said, if I was hungry and you gave me meat, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was a stranger, you took me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. 
Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee a hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw thee a strange and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? This is a profound passage right here. The righteous, those who have been serving God and sacrificed to serve God, they show up in heaven and they're greatly surprised at all the things that God said they had done. You see, when you're ministering for Jesus, you're not keeping a scorecard. You're not counting what you're doing. You're not trying to get credit for it. You're just trying to do what the Lord has sent you to do and told you to do. Then when you stand before the great royal king, when he start reciting all the stuff that you've done, you can say, when did I do that? And how did I do that? And where were we? we Lord, when did all this happen? And Jesus says, as much as you did this to the least of these, one of my brethren, you did it under me. So when you were doing something for that child, snotty nose, nappy head, mean, bad, but you still was trying to help him, you were doing it unto the Lord. When you were ministering to that cantankerous husband, cooking his food and not putting his poison in it and not even spitting it when he wasn't looking, when you still trying to do the best thing, it was like you were doing it for Jesus. And when you kept on trying to love your wife and to care for her, even though she never uh, complimented you or showed any apparent appreciation for you, you kept on doing it. Jesus said, you was doing it to me. As much as ye have did something from the least of one of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. A great, bold declaration. And then I see something else. Verse 41. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand. This is the saddest day in history right here. It's the saddest day in history. It's one thing to not have something and not know what you could have had. It's another thing to be standing right there when somebody else is getting something you wanted or you wish you could have. So to be right there standing before the royal king, and while he's blessing his children, look at what he does. He forces the unrighteous to watch while he's blessing the righteous. He forces the unrighteous to watch while they're receiving the inheritance. Those on his left hand who've been the power brokers of the day, who've been mean and taking advantage of folk and have seen to prosper, now they stand there spiritually bankrupt. They stand there naked and undone and unclothed, and they got to look at the righteous be blessed. Oh, that's, that's, that's torture in and of itself. That is torture in and of itself. You know, I was tortured down in Jackson, Mississippi. And then finally, I decided I ain't going to be tortured no more. You see, they, they got places there in the South like we ain't got there here, y'all. But you can go and get fresh collard greens. You can get candy yam. You can, all stuff fresh, man. And the big old mama come out the kitchen. You know it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I ain't lying to y'all. They come out the kitchen, the cook come out the kitchen, won't know, how good is it, honey? And I'm saying, man, I can't eat all of this stuff. Man, I can't, man, I, I'm not supposed to eat this stuff. I'm tortured right there in front of the brothers who are eating all this food. And finally, I just said, I'll pay for it next week. <laughs> I ain't going to be tortured any longer. It's nothing like that southern cuisine. But now they stand in the front of living God, and he's blessing his children, and they are tortured watching and knowing that what his children are receiving that they never will receive. And there is no second chance. So he says to those on his left hand, as I wrap this up, 41, then shall he say to them on the left hand, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. You know the horror of hell the horror of hell is that the memory is still intact. The horror of hell is that it was not created for humans, but for fallen angels. And it's not God's desire that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But when people reject Christ, God has no option but to allow them to fall into a Christless eternity that was really prepared for the devil and the fallen angels. He said, depart from me, ye curse, into everlasting fire. And they make their final plea. 
Oh, that they plead. And he, he, then, then he indicts them. He says, for I was hungry, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see thee hungry, or thirsty, or strange, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? They don't misinterpret this text. Jesus is not espousing a work salvation. He's not saying the one on his right hand got to come in because they did all those things. He's saying they did all those things because they really knew him. He's saying the only way that the world will know that you know God is by what they hear and more importantly what they see you do. What you do. That's why Paul in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Not of works. It's, just, it's by grace, through faith. It's not of works. And the faith itself is a gift of God, you see, so that no man can boast. But then in verse 10 it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained. So God saved us and leaves us here so that we can do good works, so that people can see that God's kingdom is still being advanced on the earth. So when those who profess to know Christ are not engaged in good work, there's reason to question the legitimacy of their profession. Their profession comes into question because there's not works to support the faith. And so Jesus said, you didn't do the things that I'm talking about doing here because you really didn't know me. But watch what he said. He indicts them. And then they rebuff. They say, we never saw you hungry. We never saw you naked. We never saw you thirsty. We never saw you out on the street. We never saw you like that. Because, Lord, if we have saw you like that, we would have helped you. And Jesus said, you missed the whole point. I never would have needed you to give me nothing. I never would need you to feed me or to clothe me or to take me in when I was out on the street. But there are people just like you who did need that. And the people that I died for, you closed your compassion up and you couldn't see me in them. That's what he was saying. That's what he was saying. It's what John says, how can you love God whom you've not seen? And hate your neighbor that you see every day. How can you love somebody who's nothing like you? God is nothing like us. So how can we love the one who's nothing like us and then hate folk who just like us? So he says, I never knew you. As we close, watch what he says here. So they rebuff and try to rebuke his indictment. In verse 45, he just simply says this. In this definitive explanation. Then shall he answer them saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, and as much as you did not do, you did it not to one of the least of these. The church really misses it in America. Really. And the longer I live, the more I'm saying it. We really have missed it in this country. And we may have blown the greatest opportunity that the church has ever had in any age in this country. Because the church has let it, allowed itself to be exploited by politics. The conservative wing of the church allows a party to exploit it, saying we righteous. We righteous. The liberal wing of the church allows itself to be exploited by a political group that says we're compassionate. We're compassionate. So both wings of the church ends up impotent and almost powerless because it use, loses its credibility as God's prophetic voice to do what God said. And the more and more I live, the less and less I'm concerned about what any politicians do because they're not going to do much of anything but try to get elected. I'm more concerned about what am I doing. And what are those who name the name of Christ, what are we doing? And Jesus 
always points the church in the direction of the least, the last, the left out, and the left behind. And the church ends up with no rudder. It has no credibility. And it has no power when it doesn't do what Jesus called the church to do. To minister with compassion. To share the gospel. To seek to empower and to lift people up by sharing not only out of our resources, but out of our wisdom and the things that we've learned that help us to navigate our way through this evil, wicked, decadent society. And this country is built on one single principle. Somebody got to be exploited. And that's where a capitalist free enterprise system work. Someone has to be exploited. Someone controls the capital. Someone controls the means of production. And a lot of folk going to be consumers, and somebody's not going to make much money because we got to have exploited labor. And you can get mad at me all you want to. It's the truth. And when you're mad, it's still the truth. And that's why we're exploiting jobs out of this country to the Far East and to Mexico and to Vietnam. And then we send the job down there and pay those people a dollar an hour and then bring the goods back here and charge people $150 for a pair of tennis shoes. That's capitalism. Out of control not monitored by compassion and by justice. Because justice has always answered the question, who does the earth belong to? Earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So anytime any group controls the resources to where other groups cannot benefit from God's creation, that's injustice. And those nations God judge. I'm going to leave you one, one thing to rest with all week. I'll ask you one question. What Bible did Jesus have? That's all I want to know. What Bible did he have? He had one Bible. And everything he had to say about his society was based on the principles taught in the book that he had. The only book he had was the Old Testament text. So he indicts the powerful based on what the prophet said in the Old Testament. That's still in vogue, y'all. That's still involved. So Jesus showed them the way he did ministry. And right here at the judgment seat, at the end, he tells them, this is what you should have been doing if you really wanted to be my people and to be recognized as my people and have my power. But instead, you want to bling, bling like the rest of the world. And you didn't want to get out and sacrifice to serve folk that everybody else had gave up on. You see, The Bible is true, not because I believe it, no, because I preach it. It's true all by itself. And we've been passed off something that's not really biblical Christianity. It just isn't. And we got to look back to the Bible and we see the premium and the priority that Jesus places on service and sacrifice to the least, the last, the left out, and the left behind. And they get on your nerve and they make you sick and you get tired of doing it. But you're under authority. You're under authority. And you do what the master said do. Well, I'm through. I don't know about you. But I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number. I want to be in that number. When all of God's children are gathered home. And at the separation of the right and the wrong. I want to be in that number around the throne. Don't you want to be in that number? Don't you want to be in that number? Don't you want to be in that number when all of God's children are gathered home and at the separation of the right and the wrong? I want to be in that number around the throne. And I hope to see you there. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we want to be in that number. And we know that we're only going to be there if we will put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him for our salvation. But we also know we put our faith in him and trust him for our salvation that he expects us to seek him and to seek to be like him and to serve and to sacrifice to reach other people with the gospel. 
that he sacrificed his life to bring forward. Help us, Lord, to realize that we're laboring for that which is invisible. There's another kingdom that this world doesn't know anything about. And it's only when we stand before you, Father, will we really be able to see and we really understand. I pray, Lord, that maybe there's one here this morning who's never put their faith in Christ. That maybe today they will surrender and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him for their salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed while the musician plays softly. If you're here this morning and maybe you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you may ask, well, why do I need to do that? Because the Bible says that we've all sinned. We all fall short of God's glory. And that the payment, the punishment for sin is death. It is separation from God. And that's what takes place at the throne. When they are separated from God for all of eternity. That's the second death. Eternal death. Eternal separation from God. That's the payment for sin. If we die without Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. If you're here today and you, you know that you've not accepted Christ, you know that you're not ready to meet God. But God has spoken to your heart and you want to be saved. Right where you are, pray a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I want to be saved. I want to be in that number that's on your right hand at the great separation. I want you to forgive me and come into my life and help me to be the person that you've called me to be. Meet me right where I am today, Lord Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand right where you are. God bless you, young lady. I see that hand. Sister Phyllis, there's a young lady right there in front of you. Is there someone else? God bless you. Don't be ashamed. God is a God who saves. And you might be saying, well, Reverend, you don't know what I'm caught up in. You don't know what I've done to other people, what I've done to myself. I don't really need to know. God knows. And knowing everything that there is to know about you, God still loves you. He still sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you. He still wants to forgive you. And he'll meet you right where you are. But you must invite him to come in. Is there another one? You just want to be saved today. Just raise your hand right where you are. Let someone come and pray with you and talk to you. No one is going to browbeat you or try to get you to do something you don't want to do. But we'll be derelict in our duty and our responsibility if we didn't take the time to share with you how you can escape the coming judgment. You know, salvation is... It's akin to a, an umbrella or a windshield wiper. You don't need them until it rains. I've seen people driving Lexus and Porsches and Cadillacs. I've witnessed people marvel at people's automobiles. I've never heard anybody say, man, those are some beautiful windshield wipers. We get caught in a storm. Those windshield wipers save your life. We can live without Christ. Oh, yeah, we can. Because God is so gracious that he gives us life. He will sustain life whether we acknowledge him or not. We can live without him. But it's when you exit this world, when you exit this world, that's when you really need him. And I want you to be ready to exit this world at a moment's notice, at a drop of a hat, no matter what happened. I want you to be ready to exit and not be like the five virgins in Matthew 25. They wanted to get ready, but it was too late. Door was already shut. Bridegroom had already came and took the wedding party away. They couldn't get in. If you're here today, this may be God's last time to speak to you about your need to be saved. And you young people, you think you're going to live forever. 
That's no guarantee. Nobody in this sanctuary really know how old they are. You say, what is he talking about? Now, you know the day that you were born or the day that your birth certificate says that you were born, but you don't know how old you are because age is relative. It's based on how much time you got left. So if you're 13, but if you're only going to live to be 15, you're a senior citizen. And you don't even know. We got to live life wisely. We got to live life prepared to leave this world to meet God at the next tick of the clock. And if you're not, I'm encouraging you to do it today. Do it now. If you want to be saved, just ask Christ to come into your life and save you. Raise your hand. Let someone come and pray with you. Is there another one? the Lord be praised. Let the Lord be praised and be in prayer for that young lady that's being counseled by Sister. Amen. I just heard a little voice in my ear say, Pastor Watts is 103. <laughs> that's joy in my conscience. Amen. Well, we're going to let you go. Don't forget, this afternoon we're going down to uh, be with Pastor Tony Saunders, the good people at Bible Believers Fellowship, to celebrate uh, their church homecoming. Uh, does anyone know, are they feeding you guys when y'all get there? Is the dinner being served? Yes, dinner's being served uh, right about uh, now. Service is at 3 o'clock, so uh, come out and let's support them and let's encourage them in the Lord. Uh, finally, uh, we have a, a guy here that's been a great blessing to me personally. And that's my riverboat captain here. He, uh, he's a riverboat captain. He uh, captain of the barge up and down the river here. And so he's called me a few times uh, on the radio and uh, stops by when he's off the boat. And uh, his boss came to see us last week, and uh, they're looking to hire. If you're interested in working on the barges, and I think four of the people that came last week, they're going to make them job offers. They're going to be hiring people every month. Uh, it's, it's a good job. It pays well. It's got great benefits. But you get on the boat. They don't let you off for 20 days. <laughs> you work 20 days on the boat, then you get 10 days off the boat. But it's a great opportunity. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with them to help identify men and women who really want to work. If you don't really want to work, you don't want to show up for this opportunity because this ain't about loafing and leaning. This is about work. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together, share with our benediction. Uh, while you're standing, uh, Brother William Jackson has prepared uh, some praise music. Some of you might like to have some praise music to play while you're preparing to go to work or in your car. And uh, we make them available for a modest donation of $5. It's a CD. It has a lot of the praise music that we sing here at the Grace Bible Church. And so you can continue in a spirit of worship, even you from away from this place. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us bow together for our benediction, shall we? Eternal God, now, Father, what a joy it is to serve the true and the living God. And what a privilege it is to be in the presence of the living God in worship with those of like precious faith. And we thank you, Holy Father, that you moved this morning and opened the heart of a beautiful young lady of her need to be saved. We pray for Mother Tolliver. She counseled with her and prays with her. We pray that you would give her the assurance of her salvation as she puts her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now bless these, your children. Encourage them. Lift the spirits. Give them hope. Help them to see the beauty of your creation. And help them to see your hand of provision in their lives. Help them to see your protection. And even over the difficult places, the hard places, comfort them, Lord, with your compassion your love. And sustain them, Father, to maintain a testimony as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So when they come out on the other side, they can lift up holy hands and say, I've trusted them in the valley, and I've trusted them in the storm. I've trusted them when the winds of adversity were blowing against my life. I've trusted them 
during the sun times. He's a God who can be trusted. May that be their testimony. Now to the king, eternally mortal, invisible, the only true God that lives. To him be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And all of God's people said, God bless you, saints.